Okay, good morning, everybody. We have a <clears throat> action packed day. Likely won't finish what we have to cover today, but that's okay because the next few lectures all really bleed into each other uh, in terms of the content increasingly becoming difficult. And as a consequence of that and all the chaos in the cryptocurrency market, uh, effective immediately, all problems will be addressed with double Pyridoge points. So um, now is a chance to really earn an enormous amount of Pure Doge for use and merchandise to be announced and, um, of course, grades on the test and the final. So <clears throat> let's begin where we left off. Uh, we were at this interesting isoxazole that I think uh, Tim volunteered for, but we had to cut him off because uh, class was ending. So Tim, why don't you finish your thought on how we might make this radio labeled isoxazole? I remember you mentioned something in, in the class, but I forgot what it was. Yeah, so my my thought was to start with um, labeled acetone. And um, mm. so if we made a creature like this, and reacted that with hydroxylamine, would that be okay? No, I think you'd have regio selectivity issues. Uh huh. So we need a workaround. So instead, could you install the oxime um, or make the oxime first? Perfect. There you get your product. Brilliant. All right, let's move on to the consulting corner from the archive. Very interesting compounds here. Uh, starting to introduce, we'll see a, a few of these examples today of uh, sulfones and sulfonamides that make their way into real world problems that can ca cause a, a bit of grief sometimes on the part of uh, the practitioner. So for this first one, we've got a pyrazole that is connected to a sulfonamide. So uh, in this case, we can analyze it like we did everything else and address it by looking at the two possible ring systems we can disconnect, either A or B. And um, Sung Han, do you have a preference of which way we should go? Uh, I prefer to disconnect ring A. Okay, so you prefer the build B, annulate A strategy which would um, get us back to something like? Uh, yeah, so I think maybe may start from, uh, what I think is a chloraldehyde. Oh, a chloraldehyde, okay. I'm gonna finish drawing this uh, because B onto A would basically require that, but your disconnection may be just as good. So this would um, give you the product, uh, which after formation of the ring system, you could then make your sulfonamide. Now you were saying something about an aldehyde. What is that? Uh, just a, a, use a hydrazine and react with the uh, chloro and aldehyde on B ring. Oh, okay. No, no, so that, that's fine. Essentially the same thing I drew here, but instead uh, you would want something like Like this? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so operationally making something like that, usually is going to look something like this. Yeah. Okay, um, that's great. And then let's take a look at what happens with the AB strategy. The AB strategy probably is a signaling element for disconnecting uh, this bond. And so if we do that, we end up with a simple looking pyrazole where and at the very end, we're going to have to do some sort of, let's just put PG here. It can be a PMB, it can be a SEM, whatever your favorite uh, pyrazole protecting group is here. We're going to put an X here. The X can be equal to, for instance, bromine. And here, will be that. And now we need to find a way to make this. So this can probably arise via the corresponding alcohol. We can do bromination. 
will get us there. The regio chemistry is irrelevant because the product is symmetrical. And uh, now we need just a simple synthesis of that compound, which actually um, is commercial. I might have an extra carbon here, but you get the idea. One, two, three. So we just need a way of making that. Can we make this from the simple 1,3-dicarbonyl? Sure. This would be that. And this just comes back from there. gives you your product. Any questions? Okay, cool. Let's move on to this next one. Uh, is there a key carbon here that you can see, uh, Nathan, that uh, would allow us to disconnect this extraordinarily quickly? Uh, is there a nitrile group in there? Brilliant. That's all you need to know. So once we do that, the whole thing unravels. Now it is known that when you take an alpha cyanoketone, these compounds react with the regiochemistry shown, wherein this nitrogen will attack here and this nitrogen will attack here, which is again, a part of the 20% exception rule of the hydrazine additions we saw before, where last, yesterday I showed you that you know, most of the time, the NH2 is gonna do the condensation and then the other, uh, the more nucleophilic alkylamine part will attack uh, subsequently. In this case, we are in the opposite mode. So, but that is known in literature if you take these. Question from the outside? What's that? Yeah, oh, the other thing to mention is on these hydrazine rules, it's the 80%, 20% rule we talked about yesterday, but when you're on a test, don't worry about misassigning the regiochemistry of your hydrazine addition. If you notice when you got the test back, uh, we were very lenient on the grading when you had these kind of discrepancies or nuances of regio selectivity. We didn't take points off. So, you know, this is more of a real world thing, uh, but don't want you to get obsessed about um, the exceptions that might exist for hydrazine addition. It's just good that you're exposed to it. And, and that just comes back from the ketone via uh, treatment with base and then tonsil cyanide. Great. Let's move on to this one that now has a cell phone directly embedded into the architecture. So um, for this one, there's a few disconnections you can think about. You could think about making, let's put the A ring and the B ring. You could think about making the A ring by some sort of uh, perhaps S C bond formation followed by oxidation. Uh, turns out the medicinal chemists had tried that and uh, that route was quite lengthy and not working very well. So they needed an alternative route and the one that was proposed would be the one that would generate ring B by using a sequence of chemistry that we learned on Monday uh, that doesn't involve condensation, but rather is the other main way of making pyrazoles, which is through 1,3 dipolar cycle addition. So if you imagine that this compound simply arises via the nitrile imine derivative, It's patterned really well onto that compound. Where does this compound come from? Well, you can imagine that this dimethoxyacetal could be unveiled to give you the corresponding aldehyde in C2, which you would then react with the benzyl hydrazine. The benzyl hydrazine would then uh, of course, uh, after oxidation, lead you to dipolar cycle addition. And this adduct comes as a consequence of a simple alkylation step. So this compound can be treated with first peroxide to generate the sulfone, and then mesyl chloride to generate the alpha beta unsaturated sulfone. And this, of course, just comes back from that halide. So a nice alternative way of stitching this together that doesn't involve 
um, substitution or palladium or lithiation chemistry, which they had encountered difficulties with. Finally, let's take a look at this one that um, this is from a long time ago, uh, was, was quite problematic for the medicinal chemists. Now you may look at this and say, hey, Phil, why, why can't we just do this? The pKa of this should be pretty low and therefore it should be amenable to uh, Mitsunobu type chemistry. Or perhaps you could do SN2 displacement. And this was causing quite a bit of problems. Yields were very low here. So that didn't work out at all. So they needed something, you know, much different. And so in that case, we need to start thinking about potentially looking into uh, ring synthesis. And uh, one of the annoying things about this pyrazole is, of course, the uh, position of that CF3 group. So um, let's think in sort of a cross-coupling mode. We might think, well, we might be able to take advantage of some newly emerging methods out there and some old ones as well. We might be able to think about disconnecting that CF3 using either copper conditions or palladium conditions, and that would get us back to an intermediate like this. Now we're in a realm where we should be a little bit more comfortable. So where could you get this compound from potentially? Do we see anything that is a triggering element of this heterocycle that would get us there? Kind of what Nathan said before, isn't it? There's a nitrile hiding. So if we think about it this way, all we need is the chloroacetonitrile and uh, the hydrazine and um, addition and then loss of the chlorine and then alkylation on that R and we should be good to go. But, uh, but wait, there, there's more. So you could think about this in alternative ways as well. So you could think, say, hey, Phil, why don't we just try to take this intermediate directly, let's just call it A, and uh, react it with, you would then go to SciFinder and say, you know, could I just take, is this compound available? And you would find that in fact, that compound is available. Um, it's uncertain if this reaction would necessarily work, but it's definitely something you could propose followed by oxidation. So also a completely reasonable disconnection. One could also think about looking at this from the standpoint of maybe nitration chemistry, and that would lead you down a road to that compound. If you could nitrate in the proper position, which you might be able to, that would be great. And the nice thing about this is that we can use our old friend, Bilsmeyer. that we learned before in the context of purines. That should also give you the product. Uh, that reagent is available from, as we learned last time, the corresponding carboxylic acid, which this is widely commercially available. So you make the Bilsmeyer reagent and uh, treat that with A and uh, you should get that product. And then the question is, will the nitration work out for you? Um, so those are some disconnections one can think about. There's even more. Um, the fun thing about pyrazoles is there's so many ways to uh, skin these cats. And uh, often you'll need to have four or five or more ways of doing it. In, in the modern era where there's less and less chemistry going on in your actual hood, <clears throat> many of you when you graduate may find yourselves in a world where all of your chemistry is being done virtually. And you will be a consultant. <clears throat> many of my former students find themselves in the situation where they're basically consulting all day because they're not doing anything by the hood. And so when your CRO comes back to you and says, LCMS does not comply, which is unfortunately usually what you get, um, you're going to have to give them a bunch of other ideas. And the ideas are going to have to be based upon, unfortunately, not your wisdom from the hood, but rather just knowledge from a class like this. So it's always really good to have 50 tricks up your sleeve and a plan B always waiting for when that CRO comes back to you and says, the NMR doesn't comply. Okay, let's take a look at this next problem.
<clears throat> this next problem, these R groups are, of course, shielded like all the consulting problems. So there's no enablement. There's no loss of IP. Um, these are all R groups, our alkyl groups. And um, we need to find some key disconnections first. So if you see a pyrazole like this, uh, is there a disconnection, Brendan, that you would think of to simplify things immediately? Uh, get rid of the owl group. Let's get rid of the owl group right away. Um, is there another atom we can get rid of as well? The iodine. Let's get rid of both of them. What's your reasoning for the ease with which we can get rid of those and not have any regiochemical quagmire? Um, you only have one lithiation site and then uh, the owl group should find itself on that nitrogen. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I don't even want to do lithiation. This is- sorry, innately, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, NIS, sorry. Right, innately primed for NIS right there. And then once I put that iodine on there, now the iodine is going to direct the allylation away, just like we saw with other five-member heterocycles. So the allylation should work no problem as well. Now we need a way of making that. And if that should be rather simple based on what we learned before. We just think about the 1,3-dicarbonyl. So just draw the 1,3-dicarbonyl. That looks like a great adduct from DMF, DMA. <clears throat> We can install this alkyl group via the corresponding Weinreb amide. And simply DMF, DMA. Fantastic. That initial disconnection that you made, Brendan, simplified everything moving forward. Okay, fantastic. Well, let's start with um, lecture, the part two of one, two azoles. You'll, re you'll recall there's one particular heterocycle that we left out, and that is the isothiazole. We will indeed get to that in just a moment, but first it's important to understand historically where isothiazoles actually originated. And that was this interesting natural product called colchicine. Now, uh, when I used to teach a synthesis class, we used to spend quite a bit of time working out the synthesis of colchicine and all the various manifestations of which there have been, I think more than a dozen at this point, syntheses or formal syntheses of colchicine. But it is interesting to just uh, historically look back at some of the ways that people made them. I'll, I'll cover two. One of them from Eschen Moser and uh, our own Dale Boger uh, commenced with the uh, formation of a pyrone which we learned about, which you probably thought you'd never have to see again, but here it is. That pyrone can then undergo some sort of reaction with that substituted maleic and hydride. And um, <clears throat> to help us through this, perhaps um, perhaps Simona can tell us what happens in that uh, first step there, and then I'll draw it with you. Uh, you have a deals alder, and then you can have an electrostatic like, ring opening. Now, um, Simona, can you remind me, because I'm not sure what uh, Ryan and Hans are teaching these days in, in class. Sorry? Um, can you I remind me? That? Yeah, I'm not sure what Ryan these days is teaching in the class and, and Hans. Uh, did they already cover the synthesis? Uh, yes, I believe they did. Okay, great. Uh, that's good. So we can go quick. I don't have to do much in the way of explanation. Once this compound is uh, formed, uh, then you can treat this with uh, terpetoxide and you remind me what happens there. Uh, you have a ring opening. Well, before the ring opening happens, we've got a displacement. Oh, yes. And um, this compound is going to do a ring opening, you said? Yes. Okay, so an electrocyclic ring opening. This actually has a name. Do you remember the name of this type of intermediate? Um, no. It's a norcaridine. Norcaridine, thank you, Alex. So yeah, oh, ring opens, and then after that, there's a, some, a lot of uh, different functional group manipulations to give you the product, great. So we'll skip through that because you've already covered it. And we'll go to the Woodward synthesis, which involves the sort of invention of an isothiazole. You know, um, the Woodward synthesis sort of stems on uh, logic that he has, has, has really was his hallmark. And his hallmark was making rings 
and that are difficult to thermodynamically produce in those days, things like seven member rings by uh, using tethering atoms to uh, give you reduced conformational flexibility and make things a little easier to form. He did this a lot. If you look at a synthesis of erythronolide, his last synthesis, it features the use of sulfur quite a bit in order to tether units together for intramolecularity. Uh, now, you'll see here a Friedel crafts takes place in this step, and um, this isothiazole is used as a unit to sort of protect the functionality of that amino group here and also get the stage set for all the uh, subsequent chemistry. Now, a few years ago, it became, uh, it was revealed to the community there was a secret synthesis of colchicine that had never been reported. And that secret synthesis used a pyrrole instead of an isothiazole, but we never found out about that. Uh, in the classic Woodward fashion, it was made to, we were made to believe that this was the first uh, manifestation of this idea. And I, I think it's fun to just look at the pros <clears throat> with which uh, you don't see in the literature anymore. Um, you can read this yourself, but basically he says, uh, forceful reminder of the fantastic multiformity of organic chemistry provided the fact that all the literally millions of different compounds were known at the time our plan was laid down. No simple isothiazole of any kind had been prepared. So, I mean, it's just fun to read. It's like reading a, a, you know, a novel. Consequently, we were first set about to see whether we could coax a member of the class into being. That's pretty cool. So they did, in fact, coax it into being. They used a uh, Wittig uh, reaction in order to forge the uh, key bond you see here. At the time, the Wittig reaction was a very much in vogue new reaction, kind of like the metath you know, metathesis uh, was uh, several years ago. It gives you an idea of the time they were living in. And uh, that required the synthesis of the isothiazole you see here. And in order to create that isothiazole, it was prepared from uh, this compound. By treating first, by just treating with triethylamine and uh, thiophosphine. Now we need some help and to figure out how this works. So, any thoughts on what happens when we treat uh, this vanilligosamide with uh, thiophosphine and triethylamine? And for that, perhaps uh, Tawe can help us out moving arrows. And if uh, first, uh, yeah. first the, the nitrogen, the, the electron on nitrogen would attack down, and the double bound would attack the C as double bound. Fantastic. Now what? Uh, And then I think uh, maybe the 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 proton uh, next to the ester group would leave. Yeah, yeah, and form the structure. And uh, then the nitrogen would attack the sulfur. And the CL would leave. Now, um, this is a degenerate mechanism, but you can imagine that uh, that this compound right here has one, two, three, four, five, six. This is a, actually could be viewed as an electrocyclization, six pi. Uh, yeah. Either way, um, either way you want to draw it. Now, once you get that carbine in hand, <clears throat> just an isomerization away. Uh, and proton pickup to the isothiazole. So it's debatable whether if Woodward had not done this colchazine synthesis, how many years uh, would elapse before someone would have invented it. Uh, but given their um, appearance in a lot of medicinal chemistry, I think it would have only been a matter of time before um, some medicinal chemist out there would have uh, dreamt up and made a isothiazole. But that is the origin. And it also is points to a interesting feature that undergirds the way we think about making 
isothiazole, which is if you have a structure such as this, that sulfur, of course, is not like oxygen. And uh, because of its extra orbitals, it can be oxidized and you can attack it directly. So systems like this are very amenable um, and very willing to cyclize on sulfur and aromatize. Um, the other main way we will see of making isothiazoles is via the addition of an isothiocyanate, which goes through the intermediacy of something like that. And um, when you treat this with ammonia, you can imagine that you get the imine there, which then attacks, and you lose cyanide. That's another popular way of making isothiazole, especially in the benzannulated form. But those are the two main ways we're going to see. Um, so let's take a look at how this works in the real world. So for that, we're going to look at geodon, which is an interesting compound from Pfizer. And uh, we can make a simple disconnection right down the middle, gets us to this key building block. And then we know that if we take this compound and couple it with the amine, we're going to get the product. So the question is, how do we make that? And the way they did it was they simply took this ortho bio cyano compound in the presence of air with the pipirazine, and they got the product. So we need someone to volunteer for problem of the day number one, or I'll call on someone. I can go. Oh, what do you say, Daniel? How's it work? So does the uh, sulfur just get oxidized uh, by the air? To give then, you? Huh? To give you what? Um, Does it just form the uh, sulfur oxygen bond? Not quite. What, um, what will a sulfide do in air? Anyone? A sulfide? Aha. Uh -huh. So it dimerizes? Exactly. And then what happens in your next step, Daniel? The uh, nitrogen heterocycle attacks into the cyano from the, yeah. There you go. Brilliant. <clears throat> Sulfides don't need a lot of convincing to dimerize. They're very friendly and they like to um, couple uh, and dimerize very easily. And so you can basically purchase your oxidation just from the air you breathe. Okay. Uh, so the, the attack on sulfur that you saw in the Woodward synthesis, just if you go a little bit higher, yeah. So that you would never see with oxygen, right? If you had a CO, CO. Correct. I see. Okay, thanks. Um, but let's, let's you know, I'm, I, I hate to be derailed since this lecture is so long already, um, but it's your fault, Nick. Uh, so, so uh, you know, the question is whether if you had this benzannulated, could you make, let's say, um, let's just explore this for a moment. Uh, under the right conditions, um, you can, in fact, get this kind of species to uh, now, I don't know if I have this drawn right. Let me... These can isomerize to the isoxazole. That kind of thing is known. So, uh, but that's the, your... the oxygen would come from the hydroxylamine? No, in this case, the oxygen is going to come from the aldehyde because you would activate this with like tosyl and chloride or. H plus. And so if you search literature, you may find examples like that. But to answer your original question, no, things don't attack oxygen. Oxygen is going to be doing the attacking always. I see. But in this case, it's a bit different because you don't have a leaving group like. That's right. Left. That's right. So this is only limited to, um, to benzene systems? 
Yeah, I haven't really seen this used in the Alkyl series. Yeah. I see. Okay. All right. So, yep, sure. Let's move on now to uh, this example from Park Davis, which perhaps we can use the exact same logic. Daniel, do you just want to shout out how, what my starting material is for this? Uh, same as in the problem of the day number one. Except for? I would think that would just get hydrolyzed. Uh, or, yeah. or maybe you could start with the acyl chloride. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So for instance, the acid or the ester and then that and simply add your amino acid. And you'll get out the product. That's how they made the analogs. Um, or acid chloride is fine too. Okay, let's take a look at this orexin antagonist. And, uh, you know, we only learned a couple of ways of doing this, so you don't have a lot of sh uh, choices here. Um, so can someone call out quickly how this orexin antagonist might be made? Uh, perhaps um, Kelly could help us with that. Sure. Um, can you make that from like the, if you break this S, mm, the S and bond have like the th th cyanate? Great. Awesome. Cool. So yeah, we uh, reduce nitro, we halogenate, we add in um, isothiocyanate, and um, then it cl closes shut with ammonia. Perfect. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, let's take a look at this very interesting creature. Um, this one, gee, this is a, quite a challenge. So how are we going to uh, make this? Uh, it is MedChem. So I think the first disconnection that will be greatly simplifying to us with the knowledge of it being MedChem is let's just break it in half. That's going to make our life, I think, a little bit easier here. And if we do that, we now need uh, these two building blocks. So um, let's just call this one A and let's call this one B. Let's think for a moment how we might be able to put together B. Now note here for medicinal chemistry purposes, you can have the aryl group in there, but what might be even easier to do is have the bromide there. It simplifies your retrosynthesis because differentiating these two bromides should be simple. Why do you suspect that is, Ellie? If I have a bromo here and a bromo there, why should those be easily differentiable? Um, I think the bromides uh, next to the closest to the nitrogen would be at a more electrophilic. Right. Perfect. Yeah. Next to a pyridine like nitrogen, we know that one should be reactive. So we're going to target the, this bromo compound. And um, so to make this compound, one can take advantage of a bromo deacylation reaction. Treating this with sodium hydroxide and bromine will give you your product. And then we need a way of making that. And uh, for a compound like this, all one needs to do is take a look at uh, breaking in a Woodwardian type fashion, breaking the NS bond. And that leads us down a road towards something like this. And this can just come back from that. You can use Br2 or HBr. <clears throat> we'll give you this intermediate, which immediately cyclizes to there. 
sodium hydroxide bromine will then give you your dibromo compound. Suzuki coupling takes place first here, and then your other Suzuki or whatever you want to do in the next step takes place in the other remaining bromine atom. And now all we need is a way of making this compound, which you can imagine a Mior borrelation will get us very quickly to this species. And now we've got a pretty simple looking indazole. Now, um, alkylation of this indazole under conditions that are more soft should give us our R group at that position because it would like to dock at, uh, at that um, pyridine like nitrogen as we learned about, I think on Monday. So all we need is a way of making that. And uh, that should be sort of a instantaneous uh, disconnection for you. All one needs to do to make this is have access to something like this would be fine. Or you can imagine this could come from, as we talked about the other day, that aniline is just fine. Either one, just look in your stock room. Probably you have one of these in the stock room. Either disconnection is fine. Questions? I have a question about sure. the intermediate to make the thiazole. Uh, the thiazole. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you it's have. A wicked one. Sorry? It's a wicked one. Yeah. Yeah, so you have a ketone, an amine, and a, a thioamide. Yes. Does selectivity pose an issue in this case in terms no, of cyclization? There's really not a lot of selectivity issues. You know, once you get that iminal, iminal compound, it, it will immediately cyclize, and the heat, methyl ketone just sits along for the ride. Um, there's nothing really for it to do. Um, you know, you can't really form any other size heterocycle, um, and so. In this case, you sort of are in good shape because there's nothing else that can happen. So we're not adding oxidizing agents or anything. It's just the spontaneous cyclization. Probably there's air involved. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yep. All right, great. So let's take a look at, um, and I, I should mention, by the way, I mean, if you wanted to make this compound on a test, you could also just propose the synthesis of the compound that doesn't have this methyl ketone, removing this, and then just brominating after that. You could do that. That's fine. I'm showing you what they did because it's available. But if it was a consulting corner and we didn't know this, you could easily propose just NBS uh, on the uh, compound that, that has a H here. So I don't want you to get confused and think, oh, the only way to make a dibromoisothiazole is to put that methyl ketone in there. That's not the case. That's what they did. I can't tell you whether it's, I think it's just like a BMCL paper. I can't tell you whether they tried NBS on the bromothiazole and it didn't work. I don't have that data. I'm just showing you what they did. But for a test or an interview, there would be nothing wrong with proposing the compound that didn't have this group here at all, that, that bothered nor it certainly bothers me, but that's what they did. <clears throat> great, great question. Okay, let's move on to a very famous compound uh, called uh, Pixaban or Eliquis is the trade name. And um, a Pixaban can be thought of as being broken down in two different ways. We can imagine, again, we've got the usual A, B ring system, and we have to think about breaking up one or the other. Uh, do you have any preferences, uh, Camille? Don't need the, the synthesis, just sort of your knee jerk. Which one do you think might be good? Do you want to make a pyrazole and then forge onto that the uh, dihydropyridone, or do you want to make dihydropyridone and forge onto that thing, the um, the pyrazole? I guess make a. Okay, so that's fantastic. Let's take a look at where that leads us. There's no wrong answer here. That's what, that's what that would do for you, right? That's what I would need, correct? Yes. Now, what is a potential issue or liability with this suggestion? Uh, you could condense onto the other. <clears throat> certainly, 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 yeah. That could be a problem. 
Um, and you could argue and say, hey, Phil, why don't, why don't we just get rid of that AR, make it symmetrical, and then try the arylation after that. But then you still have to worry about the regiochemical uh, ambiguity of the N arylation set. So certainly a possible disconnection that you could work through might be something that the medicinal chemist tried early on, but let's go the opposite way. If we go the opposite way, it leads us down a road towards something like this. <clears throat> and um, this one could certainly uh, work out fine, but an even simpler manifestation of this is what they ended up doing, which instead of the 1,3-dicarbonyl logic was simply to think about dipolar cycle addition. So this easily prepared intermediate could be used plus the corresponding nitrile imine. And this just comes back from and uh, this one comes back from your good friend that you remember from lecture five, the Jap Klingman. So we make our nitrile amine, we do the dipolar cycle addition. <clears throat> that's how they made Eliquis. But all these, the three disconnections we see here are ones that you would want to think about. They're all good. <clears throat> you would want to sketch all of them out. And then you would finally arrive at this, um, uh, this disconnection. Great. Let's move on to problem of the day number two, where we need three different ways of thinking about how to put this thing together. <clears throat> so for this one, well, since there's so much pyridoge in the line, it really makes sense to ask for volunteers first before I call someone. So the thing I guess I would want to try first is, oh, one, three, carbonyl disconnection. Let's just think about that first. All right, that looks pretty good. Uh, only potential liability there perhaps is the regiochemical outcome. But as we learned before, um, you know, depending on what that AR group is <clears throat> here, uh, it, it is possible that under the right conditions, you know, get the right regiochemistry. So we'll just give it to you. In, in fact- Or you can just build it in, right? Use the oxine. Correct, or well, not the oxine, but the hydrozone, you mean? Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm not sure if you can take a chlorohydrazone though and isolate it that way, but um, let's just, for the purpose of what we're discussing here, this is a, a fine intermediate that you could potentially use. So I just need a way of making that now. Could just I start? From yeah, the ketone? What, sorry? Can you just uh, do it from the ketone and then isolate from that? So how do I get enolization to take place here and not here? That's a bit of a tricky one, isn't it? So the way they do it is they start with that, simply react it with a diazo compound and BF3 and do something which you probably learned in Dale's class. That gives you that. And then you can take that and uh, turn it into the corresponding aryl ketone. Okay, so no problem there. That, that certainly is decent. Uh, any other disconnections? Let's look at just all of our, let's take a look at all the options we have on the table here. Any other ones, Alex? Going back to the Pyrazol uh, lecture notes from last uh, time. 1-3 cycle addition. Yeah, let's think about 1-3 cycle addition. And maybe the favorite one here would be um, like a Sidnone.
Only problem is synonyms don't react that well in an intermolecular form with unactivated olefins because they're subject to the rules and regulations of dipolar cycloaddition, which prefers to have either highly activated or highly electron deficient olefins. So in order to get this to work, perhaps one could go via the enamine, but then again, you'd have the problem of which enamine do you make, that one or that one? So a little bit too much ambiguity for my taste. We're gonna have to pass on that one. So let's take a look at what they actually did. This is kind of cool. They disconnected this molecule from the corresponding hydrozone, but in a way which is a bit different than we've seen before. So when you simply treat this with base, out pops the product. We've got addition here, addition there, loss of NO2, just like the uh, barred zard synthesis of pyroles. Remember that? Same type of logic going on here. Why do you think that these folks on process scale might like to do it this way? Is this crazy nitro compound going to be easy to make? What do you think? Uh, Kelly, what would the reaction be that you would use to make that? Let's see. Can you do a Henry reaction? Perfect. Brilliant. With benzaldehyde? Awesome. That's what they did. Henry, take the hydrozone, condense it, and then at the end, after your uh, pyrazole is made, reductive emanation forges that last key bond you see there. But the med chemist did use Alex's approach at the top. And the process chemist used the bottom approach. Fantastic. Let's take a look at this interesting little kinase inhibitor. So for this kinase inhibitor, um, we need to first make some simplifications. And uh, if you're a med chemist, probably you see there's two pretty good inputs. There's an input here of diversity and there's an input here of diversity. And so if we move backwards then, we know that that is probably our gateway to diversity at that position. And this amino group is our gateway to putting all sorts of fun things at that position. And now all we have to do is go back one step more um, and think about how we can rapidly make that isothiazole. And the fun thing about this particular isothiazole that's a sort of a Pareto isothiazole is that that sulfur atom is at the perfect spot to do exactly what you might want to do. So you can imagine that all you have to do is get your hands on this compound. We see there is a hiding cyano group right here. There's our hiding cyano group. And uh, you can imagine that um, you can use whatever your favorite uh, thiol nucleophile is. You can use something you could, if you wanted to, you can treat it with SCN minus. Um, you could also treat it with a thiol nucleophile like that, followed by deprotection uh, to give you the corresponding SH compound. And those just treating them with ammonia and um, an air will give you the isothiazole, uh, the amino isothiazole. So you have a lot of options in the table. Uh, where does this thing come from? Well, we, we know how to make that. One of our favorite reactions in the world when we talked about pyridine synthesis. Um, does this remind you anyone of anything? Let's give triple doge if they can get this one. Goretzky Thor. Oh boy. Simone is printing cash here. All right, so then we know We can just get it from there. So that can be brominated. And then PLCL3, you get your product. Of course, you can buy this, but if Aldrich is broken, uh, you can also make it very easily from really cheap chemicals using Guarashi Thor. Fantastic. Let's move on to problem of the day number three, where we have this um, glorious little cage match between the med chemist and the process chemist. And um, so to, uh, is, do we have any, we have, let's see who our med chemists are. We've got Sung Han, Nathan, Brendan, Taiwei, Ellie, Alex, Noor, Nick, Fang. 
those are our medicinal chemists. Anyone from that group want to volunteer on uh, thoughts on how we might be able to do this, uh, generating analogs in the process? Yeah, so I guess I would want to clear um, the pyridine kind of on the top half and then also the ether. So you could do like cross coupling and then SNAR on the bottom. I like that. That's the intermediate you want, Alex? Yeah, and then that iodine is also pretty clearable. So you could just get rid of that also. Put that in with NIS. I'm going to give you a clue that both a proton or an NH2 may be fine for you. OK, both are fine. If it's proton there, and NIS is great. If it's an amine, then Sandmeyer is great. Either one is fine. And now look what we have. We have our favorite little quagmire. We have two rings. In this case, these two are pretty, very, you know, pretty similar in terms of aromaticity. So which one do we disconnect? Um, gee, anybody, you know, which one? If we, let's say, go A into B or B into A, based on the rules we have learned so far in the past 14 lectures, they look kind of equivalent, don't they? They both have two nitrogen atoms. One is six, one is five. There's some symmetry there. Gee, if you only knew how to make pyrazines, you'd be in trouble. And if you only knew how to make pyrazoles, you'd be in trouble. But luckily, you folks know how to make both. Hooray. So what do you say, Noor? There's no wrong answer. Or just tell me which one you like. In instinctively, what do you want to do? You're the med chemist well, at the bench. You tell me. Considering that it would be difficult to install that chloro group you selectively later on, I would want to start with the, with the B ring. Okay, so if we start with the B ring, that means you're going to have to tell us about how to make that A ring in an efficient fashion. So yeah. what groups? Um, I'm going to put the chloro as you requested. Um, I don't know what I need here and here. I need your help on that. So what do I put at um, the A and B position here? Honestly, for the A, I would put a bromo, and the B, I would put an aldehyde. and hope I get selectivity with the... Why do you need to juice it up with the bromo? Isn't the aldehyde enough to already give you the juice you need? That I is, guess if I worry a little. Product. It should, but I, I guess I worry that the other chloro might, like, I don't know how reversible it would be um, um, if it just adds in and then... It, it, it's a good it's a good consideration, but uh, you know you would then search and you'd find that the worry is misplaced and that the dichloraldehyde shown here nucleophiles will favor to add in the other position. And what that does for you is nice because in order to make this, it's going to be really useful to take advantage of that symmetry. Now imagine if we used your building block. How do you do this, Nor? Yeah, it'd be more challenging to make. I don't know how to do that. There's no yeah. available literature to do that. So I need to pick this. I need to pick this building block, and I need to then hope that if I look in SciFinder, I find precedent for nucleophiles adding there, and then I pleasantly am surprised by that finding. Great. Of course, you don't necessarily even need to worry about nucleophiles adding in this position first, because if you just do it under gentle conditions, which make the hydrozone here, all your problems are solved. Right. So it's a yeah. moot point. Even if this was a less reactive one, you'd still win. That makes sense. Yeah, great. All right. Well, I don't see anything wrong with this at all. Uh, does anybody want to go the opposite way? What does that look like if we go the opposite way? Well, it, it probably means we need something that um, looks like this. We're going to need something that looks like this. Right? 
And you may immediately say, geez, Phil, that looks pretty ugly. And uh, you would certainly be right. That is not the prettiest looking creature. But actually, the functional equivalent of that can be this. Turns out when you take pyrazoles like this, amino pyrazoles like this, and you nitrosylate them, they nitrosylate at carbon, not at nitrogen. And uh, taking this compound and treating it with dimethylmalonate, gives rise to this. Okay, so the med chemist could do either of these approaches. And um, this one that Noor pointed out certainly to me is the most logical. This other one would require knowledge for knowledge that you could do these, make these diamino equivalents through the carbon nitrosylation. So definitely less intuitive, but an option that is available to you on the table. With these two disconnections in mind, we now need someone from the process chemistry table. Kelly, Simona, Nguyen, Daniel, Carter, Junchen, Tanner, Schwang, Debbie, any of those who are willing to uh, in, uh, earn some doge, which uh, approach would you choose as a process chemist? Now we know as a process chemist what our AR group is. We know what our group is here. All of these things are known. You don't need to worry about diversity at all. Just need to make one target. Anybody from the process side, help us out. I think I would choose to start with B and annually on A. Yeah, so uh, great, brilliant. So if we do that, it means that we're gonna need something like this. So we're gonna use Nora's disconnection where we can treat with, we can lithiate And that's exactly what they did. And this happens a lot. Um, you see OPRD papers, or you see real world examples where the med, med chemists have, have done a few different routes. And it turns out that the process chemists just choose one of the routes. It's happened, it's pretty commonplace. I mean, there's only so many ways to skin this cat. So, you know, um, there's not a lot of room for enormous creativity in, in inventing new, new strategies here. So, fantastic. Great job. Uh, sorry, I have a quick question. Sure. So the med can the last med can rob you proposed the amino pyrazole. Uh, would you expect that molecule is stable? Because I, I guess if there's a amino group on the electron rich. Correct. Uh, exactly. Yeah. That would be my concern as well. So the nitroso compound is a fleeting compound, which you'll immediately dump in dimethylmalonate to. You won't isolate that compound. Great question. And it's probably why this, why I draw this in quotes, it's not the first thing I would come up with, that's for sure. Okay. I definitely wouldn't propose this. Um, you know, now, now I would, because I know about it, but it's a less intuitive approach for exactly the reason you pointed out. It is an electron deficient heterocycle, but gee, now you've added two amino groups on it. it looks, looks really scary. So the workaround is the nitrosylation. Obviously, the process chemists don't want to do this. If they didn't do it, but for certain analogs, it worked out well for the med chemists. All right, uh, great question. So uh, this interesting kinase spindle inhibitor. Who knows what that means? Uh, we need a way of disconnecting this compound very quickly. Is there a bond which you think is one that could be strategic that would allow us to simplify this in a dramatic fashion. Stone, any ideas? What strikes you as being particularly potentially scary here? Uh, the free amine. Oh, yeah, let, the free amine, maybe even this side chain, um, you know, here. So you can imagine if we just delete that completely, it's possible that you could imagine uh, doing some sort of benzylic you wouldn't need to do this, but you could, they did. Some sort of benzylic or, uh, yeah, bromination followed by SN2. And that would give us 
just a starting material that looks like that. And now we have two different possibilities for our disconnection, just as we did before. Before we had a pyrazine that was connected to an isothiazole, uh, or it was a pyrazole. Now we have an isothiazole connected to a pyrimidinone. Luckily, you know how to make both of these things. So uh, we need some suggestions on what would happen if we went A to B or B to A. And um, perhaps uh, Tim could just tell us which one intuitively with a one microsecond analysis do you prefer? And we'll do that one. I would build B. You would start with A and you would build into B, which would mean we would need this compound. And you could look at this compound and say, oh, um, this looks like it might be some sort of uh, Woodward-like maneuver. And that would get us back to an intermediate-like. that, which then comes back to that by adding in um, really whatever your favorite uh, Na2S could be fine. And this just comes back from Milanol dinitrile and uh, formulating. So let's just get rid of that, great. Um, treat this with uh, some sort of oxidant. It should be good there. And um, we need to add in our nitrogen. And uh, we are good to go there. Uh, so great. Uh, how do we forge the pyrimidinone? Well, that's just three plus three logic. So with that uh, compound in hand, we can use what we learned before um, in order to forge a pyrimidinone through three plus three. So if we go the opposite way, we now need to make the isothiazole. And that requires making an intermediate like this. Just as we learned before. And you can imagine thiocyanate addition followed by ammonia will give you your desired product. Where does this thing come back from? Well, again, three plus three logic. That gives us back to an intermediate that looks like that. Plus that. Questions? Then POCl3. So both disconnections are just fine. Either one could be potentially employed here. The only one that would maybe give you a sort of a pause of a little bit of a concern would be potentially the bottom route because you would have to find some good literature precedent to make sure that the condensation took place here and here because if any condensation were to potentially happen here, you would get the wrong regioisomeric outcome. So that would be basically what you would search in SciFinder is to make sure that that regiochemical outcome is gonna be okay for you. Wait, Phil, why wouldn't, if you did the POCl3, why wouldn't you also dehydrate the other amide? Um, if you control the, yeah, that's a good point. You could get the dichloro compound, but that's not of, uh, you know, big consequence because, you know, in the subsequent step, you just do a mono addition followed by hydrolysis. Or, or if you can control the conditions well with POCl3, you can probably stop it at the mono. So for those reasons, I would like, I would prefer the approach that you outlined above, Tim. But if you put, you know, the bottom one on a test, we couldn't necessarily take much credit off. What do you say there, Max? Uh, question on the outside. Question from the outside. Um, what, shoot. I just want to know about the general stability of uh, uh, thiazoles with like benzoyl oxidation conditions. Do you expect to get the benzoyl oxidation rates of thiazole for the reunited? Well, they did it just uh, with benzoyl peroxide and NBS. And it, so, 
isothiazoles are stable to oxidative conditions. It's the reductive conditions that take them apart. Um, that's kind of what, how Woodward um, made his uh, isothiazole disappear using rainy nickel. But under oxidative conditions, they're fairly robust. Yeah, good question. How about ibrutinib? This is a very famous uh, kinase inhibitor with a interesting little acrylamide covalent reactive group attached to it. And uh, we need a way of thinking about this from both the medicinal chemistry and process angles. Um, so for this one, for the sort of medicinal chemistry approach, uh, who could offer us a suggestion for where to go? Are there some key units of spinach that we can immediately extract from the structure? Uh, I think you can disconnect the benzene ring and the, the bottom six membrane. So we'll make that an iodine. Okay. And then probably we can disconnect this thing, maybe through some sort of Mitsunobu. Yeah. Or alkylation. And uh, that gets us back to. This compound. And um, this compound, we know we probably can install this through an NIS step, as um, Alex taught us before, leading us back to this simple looking molecule, where we now have, again, these two choices of either disconnecting one way or the other. We need to know both. So for that, uh, perhaps um, Carter can give us a idea of which disconnection uh, he prefers. Um, I was thinking breaking A and then perhaps having a hidden nitrile. He has astutely identified that carbon as being the sneaky hiding nitrile. Quick way of making that. Can we use the um, same logic you just used before? Yeah, using uh, the di cyano compound condense onto thiourea or urea. Ooh, thiourea, I'm not seeing the, the thiourea, let's say, but I do see the dinitrile. And in order to make this uh, pyrazole, all I need to do is add in hydrazine. Is that what you meant? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was looking from the other, other side. But yeah, that makes more sense. OK, fantastic. So <clears throat> that will work. And then we need a way to think about going from A to B. Um, thoughts on how we might be able to do that? Do you see any hidden symmetry there? If we could draw back to the diamino uh, diazine. So the diamino pyrimidine, you can imagine if we had a methyl group here, maybe we could use sodium nitrate. Is that what you mean? Um, yes. On paper, it would be fine. In practice, the conceptual equivalent of this that is a little bit easier to get your hands on and very cheap and more workable would simply be to take the dichloropyrimidine aldehyde and treat that with, with hydrazine. And that would give you the chloro compound, which you could then treat with ammonia to give you a desired product. A little bit easier to handle in this thing, which is probably going to be very uh, air uh, prone to oxidation, as well as very water soluble and difficult for the practitioner to actually do much with. So that's our two disconnections for MedChem. For a process, well, we can select from these two. And uh, it looks pretty clear that if we know what the group is that we want here, and we know what the group is we want here, 
might be easy to simply start with the dichloropyrimidine because it's very easy to methylate that position. We dump in our aryl uh, <clears throat> chloride here and uh, that is great because now we don't need to worry about doing any cross coupling to put the aryl in. And then finally, we can put our big old hydrazine unit as one piece. So you can make independently this. So it's triply conversion. We've got our fragment here, our fragment here in the form of the acid chloride, and we've got our hydrazine fragment here. Dump them together. And then, of course, uh, append that acrylamide at the end, and you get out a brutinib. Great. Any questions? If not, let's move on to the next uh, consulting corner, which uh, has again now this annoying sulfur atom, but uh, not once, but actually twice. Oh, sorry, uh, before I get to the consulting corner, I, I actually forgot this part here. This little one is a problem of the day that is extremely exciting because it's so simple. You might say, uh, why are you even teaching this to us? This is trivial. This must be trivial, right? So if it's so trivial, why don't you give us the answer? Who's going to volunteer for a problem they didn't before? Is it hard just because the bromination selectivity of the parent uh, pyrazoles? Uh, ah, so let, I want to draw your idea, Brennan. You're suggesting just making this compound. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, but that's going to be a problem. It, what, why is it going to be a problem? Uh, so you should get bromination at the other, um, the non, yeah, undesired. Correct. So that that's a no-go. <clears throat> what else do we do? I have a question about doing the ring substitution. Um, is this an example where you can do something, like put something in the more reactive position first that you could burn off later? When you say more reactive position, I need your help to understand. Uh, you're like you're saying, you'll get the wrong selectivity for the bromo adding in, right? So oh. if you have something else add in at that position and then do the bromination, you won't have another open site, right? Ah, so you mean, great, let's do Alex's disconnection. So Alex is suggesting that we do instead um, this compound. for instance, that. And then we have blocked it. And then later on, we can potentially uh, decarboxylate, for example, right? Yeah, something like that logic. Um, and, oh, sorry, I have the wrong. Uh, no, no, sorry, I have the wrong. Yeah, I, switch it. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah, unfortunately, that's a great idea. Um, they tried it, but the bromination didn't work. Great idea. Um, we can draw the one that I drew before. And say, oh, hey, Phil, how about a good old Hunsteaker here? Uh, unfortunately, the Hunsteaker, instead of doing the uh, decarboxylate bromination, which had some precedent, instead, the product it gave was, again, the dreaded bromo isomer there. Could you just you do it? Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, folks. Could, oh, you... could you do a Sandmeyer? Aha, Sandmeyer. So Sandmeyer would look something like that, correct? Where does that come from, Noor? I would start with the alpha beta unsaturated cyano Perfect. with like a chloro. Perfect. You could put the halogen in there to begin with, but what they did was they first treated with bromine and then methyl hydrazine. And that gave them that, which they could then uh, do the Sandmeyer, which the yield was about 20 to 30%, although it was good enough to make a first batch of a few kilos. This um, chemistry comes from the uh, legendary Eastgate group at um, BMS. 
okay, so we need a slight alternative to this because the Sandmeyer is low yielding. And so when in doubt, a sneaky trick that you can use is to play the oxidation state game. So we're gonna do Nor's logic again, but instead we're going to react it with this. That's going to give us that compound in 84% yield, kilogram scale. And then finally, a little bit of bleach. Gives us around 50% yield of the desired product. So an enormous amount of effort went into figuring out an economical way to make this tiny little building block. A lot of root scouting, a lot of ideation, a lot of going to the lab, figuring out what didn't work, and then going back and trying again. So very, very exciting process chemistry there. Yeah, yeah. I just have a quick question. I know you don't, I know you don't like getting derailed, but um, what if you took the, the oxime, the ketone, the oxime, and then the cyano compound and treat that with HBr? Would that snap shut like if you tosylated the oxime? But, but oxime, you, you mean? Yeah, on the, on the nitrogen one. So we just took that back to the ketone on the, uh, yeah. But, but oxime, you mean hydrozone? I'm not quite no. getting you. No, no, so you build the oxidation state into the nitrogen. So you build the NN bond using the, so if you build the oxime there, N-O-T-S. Okay, okay, okay. And then, how do I put uh, my methyl group in? Is there any way to do that after? Is that just a mm, That's going to be, that's, that's a problem. They really want to, uh, you know, because then, then you're in process scale, you got the methyl iodide, you're going to have mixtures for sure. You're going to probably have a, it's not going to be perfect uh, isomer distribution. And separating those two compounds is going to be a, a nightmare on scale. Can you imagine you're on multi kilogram scale. Um, so, really, one of, I'm glad you asked that question, Brendan, because one of the key, criteria of the analysis is that ultimately the winning route must start with methyl hydrazine. It must, because we don't want to use methyl iodide. We don't want to have regiochemical uh, discrepancy. So that's like, I think at the ideation stage, basically everyone was given the mission that thou must start with methyl hydrazine and don't think about anything else. Okay, great. Um, you know, we're running short on time, but as I mentioned, a lot of these other things that we're gonna be talking about really fit in well to um, the subsequent lectures. So rather than speeding up and confusing you all, I'll just go at the normal pace. So this little consulting corner here involves now two different sulfur atoms. We've got, um, oh, this is a mistake, sorry. Uh, we've got the sulfonamide and we've got the, um, again, isothiazole, uh, this case an isothiazolone. And so we need a nice way of putting this together. One, two, four, five substituted aromatics are some of the trickiest consulting problems you see out there. Those are not that easy to make. There's generally a lack of good methods to controllably get you there. So uh, we need a thought on how we might be able to do that. And uh, one thing you might think about is first we have to get rid of the substituent fastest that makes sense. And um, that might be through some sort of uh, preparation of the sulfonamide. Now, one of my favorite ways of making uh, sulfonamides, if we had, let's say, a metal here, like let's say zinc, is by using a method from about six years ago that came from the Buckwald group using this reagent called TCPC. Very nice uh, reagent that uh, when reacted with a nucleophile will give you very cleanly the SO2OAR group, which can then be converted into the sulfonamide by adding any amine you might like. Now, how do we make that? 
you might say, well, hey, Phil, can't we just do direct methylation from this compound? And unfortunately, even if you have a protecting group here, the problem you're going to have is that the direct methylation is likely going to go here. So you have two options. One is you can put a TMS trick, put a TMS there, then lithiate here. Option number two is use ChemDraw. And ChemDraw tells you that you can be able to, you can, in fact, put a bromo here selectively. So the ChemDraw trick is the one to use. You convert that arrow bromide into the arrow zinc. And now all you have to do is uh, make the starting material. Now, it turns out that this compound is actually uh, commercial. So if you're in a real company, you would just tell your CRO, buy that and brominate it. But, um, and you probably want to put a PMB on there before you do your methylation chemistry. Uh, but if it wasn't available, you could also imagine that this could be derived from from a compound like that. And that is also commercial. Okay, fantastic. So um, can you start with the symmetric um, molecule? So like having the di, amide dihalo functionalize one end and then sort of do decarboxylative chemistry to install, to put a lithium, like a, to lithiate or to metalate um, proximal to the halo group. So a symmetrical compound, give me the numbers of where the different groups would be. Okay, so you have one and five would be ester or amide, and then two and four would be um, halo groups. So you'd like put in the SCN, then do, um, then close up your ring to form the thiazole. And then on the other side, sort of do the carboxylative chemistry on the ester to metalate at that position. And then quench with your sulfur surrogate. Well, there's not a good way of decarboxylative lithiation, but you could do some sort of, let's say, Hunsteeker that would give you the bromo that you need. Um, so that is a creative idea. I love it. It's really good. I mean, in fact, it's the kind of idea that I would say, all right, it's good enough that I would go to SciFinder and see what the commercial availability of this symmetrical compound is. I would find out. Certainly, if you propose that on a test, you, you would get credit. In an interview, they'd probably really love you because uh, it's very creative. Uh, but in the real world, the only proviso I would say is let's just side finder and see is this commercial or not, or how how easy is it to make that thing. If it is easy to make, then yeah, that's a decent suggestion. Yeah, pretty good. Thanks, Nora. Definitely worth a bunch of pyridos for that. All right, so I think we have yeah we have time for the uh, this problem of the day. Uh, you're a medicinal chemist, and uh, the question is, I need to make this these two compounds in the fastest way possible. So one way of making them would, of course, be individually targeting their synthesis. Another way to make it would potentially look for a common intermediate. So maybe that exists. I don't know. I need your help. What would be the common intermediate I could use if there did exist one? Uh, chloro really high. Brilliant. And to go to that compound, I would just need methyl hydrazine. And to go to that compound, I would just need something like that followed by ammonia. Brilliant. Great job. All right. Let's take a look at this next compound. Um, this, uh, I think it's some sort of uh, dual inhibitor of these two enzymes. And um, in the final, I guess we'll have time for this one. So let's label the ring systems, A and B, and um, think about what might be a knee-jerk response for um, putting these together. And um, we just need your first thought that comes to mind, maybe, maybe, um, maybe Tiffany. Yeah, I guess I would want to disconnect ring A. Okay, great. So if we disconnect ring A, that means we need something that looks like potentially
And uh, you know, you correct me if I'm misinterpreting what you wanted. Something like that, perhaps? Yeah. And um, maybe we get lucky and we can find conditions to do selective um, Suzuki or selective uh, indissolve formation uh, followed by the, um, you know, one followed by the other. Hopefully we don't get reach of chemical mixtures there. So definitely a possible disconnection. And that is, again, taking B and fusing on A. But what if we think about A and fusing on B? Um, is there something we can do there that perhaps is reminiscent of a method we learned at the very beginning of, I think it was lecture number seven or eight, the synthesis of pyridines. Can you use Meldrum's acid and an aryl aldehyde and do a haunch? Aha! There is a hanch that is hiding in here. Simona sees it. Do all of you? And you can take this compound decarboxylate, and then you can treat it with POCl3. You can make more analogs, or you can simply reduce off the chloro. But what is likable about this is just simply the sheer diversity and speed with which you can get aryl analogs here. And potentially in the future, if you wanted to, you can even do additional Suzuki's to take a look at that chloro compound. That is fantastic. Uh, oh, the only thing we need, oh, sorry. You're not done yet, Simona. We need to make that. There is a hidden nitrile. So can you just disconnect to the trifluoro um, ketone with the cyano? So if there's a site finder outage, Simona's not gonna be in trouble, that's for sure. Fantastic. All right. And I guess in the final, we have two minutes, so we might as well keep going. Let's just see if we can address this last one in the final two minutes. It looks to be rather straightforward. And um, I guess what we can do is in the same fashion as we have done before, uh, eliminate an exogenous group that will be installed through a diversity step. So to save time, let's just convert that to a triflate. That leads us down a road to an intermediate like this. And we'll abbreviate the uh, pyrazine with a PY. That again comes back from the corresponding isothiazolone. Which in turn comes back from the corresponding thiol. And this can be formed from the corresponding fluoro compound. And now it's time to address that lingering issue of the, where did the pyrazine come from? That came from the corresponding bromide. And finally, using our rules of lithiation, which you so deftly employed during the midterm, we know that we can take that pyridine and isolate it to get us our primary amide. And that is where I think we will, uh, that is exactly uh, we how, are. How, how yeah. did they form the, um, the SM bond? Uh, you can form this in a variety of ways. Um, you can use your you can use uh, Na2S. 
You can use your favorite, um, this nucleophile. You can even use, people use thiourea is a nice way, sneaky way of adding in um, your, so any of these options are available to you in the real world. So they, so you basically have to oxidize the sulfur to form the SN one, right? Yeah, correct. Exactly. Air, air. Yes, exactly. Oh, so you, you just treat that with air and that will cyclize. You got it. Exactly. Just like okay. we did before. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. Tim. Yep. Brilliant. Well, um, you'll see all we have to do on Monday uh, is cover a little bit of this consulting, this very strange looking pyrazole pyridazine thiophene, which I'm sure might give you nightmares. Uh, and then we will be back on track uh, for next week, which is the probably the most intense week of this class. Four lectures, not back to back to back, but there's going to be one on Monday and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, it will be intense, so I suggest you use your day off on Friday to really review everything we've talked about before, uh, and we will keep doing double pyridoge for lots of extra points uh, during this very, very hard next week. So get a lot of sleep over the weekend, study as much as you can. It's going to be a lot of fun and is sort of the climax of complexity for this class. So uh, a lot of real world examples next week. And um, so have a great weekend and rest of the week, and we'll see you then.